Welcome back to my channel. I am Joshua T. Whaley, author of Lost Cannibal Manifesto, amongst other titles. With that said, let's jump into today's material, which is also from my upcoming book titled Forbidden Genesis, The Untold Story of Man. Now let's read Chapter 35, The Origins of Yahweh. Side note, anytime I use a Bible quote, it does come from the New King James Version. Let's begin. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Exodus 15.3 Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Psalms 24.8 His name was initially composed of four Hebrew consonants, YHWH or YHVH, to the Israelites, and is also known by the Greek term meaning the word of four letters, the Tetragrammaton. The many interpretations of YHWH throughout the years include he that is, I am, or he who makes that which has been made, among others. Then, in the 16th century, Christian scholars changed the name to Jehovah, which has fallen out of favor in modern times, so we will not be using that term. But now comes the first real controversy in this video. There will be more. Before Yahweh presented himself to Moses by name, he was unknown to the patriarchs Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who only knew God as El Sadihi, English translation, God Almighty, or just El. The name is sometimes confused with the term Elohim, also used in the Bible, which is actually the plural form of El. This is understood to mean the Council of El or El's Council, hence why the Bible multiple times refers to God saying, Let us like us, or in our, all of which are plural pronouns, words that refer to more than one person or thing. Because of this, some scholars believe Yahweh was a lesser God, small g, and just a possible member of the Elohim and not El, the creator of the heavens and earth. The fantastic book written by Michael S. Heiser titled The Unseen Realm was the first time I had ever heard this and basically started me down this rabbit hole about four years ago. I definitely recommend it to anyone looking to further explore this point. Here is one of the numerous examples of El's counsel, the Elohim in the Bible. God, El, stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods, the Elohim, Psalms, 82.1. Now, let's hit this point out of the park with Yahweh not being the same as El, but instead just one of the Elohim. When the Most High El divided their Elohim inheritance to the nations, he separated the sons of Adam. He set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the children of Israel. For the Lord's Yahweh Portion is his people. Jacob is the place of his inheritance. Deuteronomy 32, verse 8 and 9. My question is, if Yahweh was given the children of Jacob, were the other Elohim given the children of others or other nations? This is something that I have not found the answer to as of yet. One other fact for this argument, especially for Christians, is that Jesus Christ never used the term Yahweh, only referring to God as the Father, God, or in a few more ancient texts, El. However, there is another side to this argument, for if he had used the name Yahweh, he would have been considered a blasphemer, as the name was forbidden to be spoken by the Jews during this time. Yet, as we know, Jesus was a radical and would have had no problem blaspheming to make a point. Okay, now that I know I've upset a lot of people for saying Yahweh is not the supreme God, and they've clicked off of this video and gave me a thumbs down, let's go ahead and continue for those of us who are open-minded and want to learn the truth of who we are. First, the problem with tracing the origins of the name Yahweh in Scripture is because, as I mentioned earlier, in the time that the books of the Old Testament were composed, it was forbidden to speak or write his name. Because of this, he is referred to as Lord, or any form of the expression, I am. 
So tracing biblical roots puts his first mention in Exodus chapter 3. When the Lord tells Moses that he wants to free the children of Israel and bring them out of Egypt. But there's more to the story that was not covered. I have to watch what I say because I don't want to give away what was in chapter 34. Now Moses was tending to the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest in Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of the bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see the great sight, why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he had turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not draw near this place. Take off your sandals off your feet. For the place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. And the opening of this chapter, it states, And the angel of the Lord appeared, and not the Lord appeared. Why? If it was El, then the passage should have said, And the Lord appeared. This could possibly be that, at the time of the story, the Israelites were still polytheistic and not monotheistic. In other words, the God who appeared to Moses was only one of the Elohim and not El. Now that I have raised the question of if it was indeed the supreme God who appeared to Moses, let's now read where the name Yahweh is given. Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and they Say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they say to me, What is his name? What should I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Moreover, God said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. Exodus chapter 3, verses 13 through 15. And there it is, the first biblical reference to the name Yahweh as God, through the expression, I am. However, there are a few earlier mentions of Yahweh which are older than the book of Exodus and the hotly debated time of its writing, sometime between the 9th and 6th centuries BCE. With most scholars agreeing, it was most likely written during the Babylonian exile of the 6th century. As of the time of this writing, the oldest known reference to the name Yahweh is found at the base of an obscure column in the Temple of Celeb in Nubia, modern-day Sudan, built by Imhotep III who reigned from 1386 to 1353 BCE. Carved into the column was the description of a people referred to as the Sashu of YHW, meaning Sashu of Yahweh. The Sashu were a Semitic-speaking people. Some historians describe them as being nomadic or semi-nomadic, while others claim they only inhabited the area between Nubia and Egypt. Some scholars even go on to describe the Sashu as criminals due to some Egyptian hieroglyphs referring to them as such. There is a document from the 19th dynasty that makes reference to these people. I'm going to screw up these names. Another communication to my lord. We have finished letting the Sashu tribes of Edom pass the fortress of Mernahup Hotep Har Mat which is in Tajiki, to the pools of Per Autumn of Myrna Hotep Hire Mati of Tahiki to keep them alive and keep their cattle alive. Israel and Egypt, Siegfried Herman, 1973. I, I probably butchered that name, the, the Egyptian name. 
Anyway, this sounds more like a first time author, myself included a very long time ago, Prophecy of Zachariah, anyone? Trying to up the word count by repeating themselves over and over and over again. What this text shows is that they may indeed have been a nomadic, animal herding people, and that they were connected to the tribe of the Edomites who were associated with the Israelites. So through the science of six degrees of bacon, hopefully some of you will get the reference, they were a Semitic people, but they were not Hebrew, meaning other tribes worship Yahweh besides those most associated with the deity. Another controversial way to look at it is Yahweh was a lesser desert god or storm god who the Israelites adopted as their own. With this in mind, this could possibly be how he knew the way to lead Moses and his people out of Egypt. Another mention of Yahweh that predates the official written record of him, meaning the book of Exodus, is known as the Meshu Steel. Discovered in 1868, the Mesha steel was erected by King Mesha of Moab in celebration of his victory over Israel sometime around 840 BCE. This battle is also described in the Bible. However, here the story is changed to the Israelites winning the battle against King Mesha. Now it happened in the morning when the grain offering was offered the suddenly water came by way of Edom, and the land was filled with water. And when all the Moabites heard that the king had come up to fight against them, all who were able to bear arms and older were gathered, and they stood at the border. Then they rose up early in the morning, and the sun was shining on the water, and the Moabites saw the water on the other side, as red as blood. And they said, This is blood. The kings have surely struck swords and killed one another. Now, therefore, Moab to the spoil. So when they came to the camp of Israel, Israel rose up and attacked the Moabites, so that they fled before them. And they entered their land, killing the Moabites. Then they destroyed the cities, and each man threw a stone on every good piece of land and filled it. And they stopped up all the springs of water and cut down all the good trees. But they left the stone of Ker Harasheth intact. However, the slingers surrounded and attacked it. And when the king of Moab saw that the battle was too fierce for him, he took with him 700 men who drew swords to break through the king of Edom. But they could not. Then he took his eldest son, who would have reigned in this place, and offered him as a burnt offering upon the wall. And there was a great indignation against Israel. So they departed from him and returned to their own land. 2 Kings, chapter 3, verses 20 through 27. A prevailing modern day belief is that the Moabites may have also worshipped Yahweh due to the mention of King Meshes seizing the vessels of Yahweh and bringing them to Chemosh, as told on the steel. It could be that the king felt the property belonged to his people and was only reclaiming what was theirs. It is an intriguing possibility, considering both sides were located in the land of Canaan, where the worship of Yahweh was taking root as the one supreme God. Another interesting fact regarding Yahweh is that he was also seen as the god of metallurgy in the Canaanite pantheon. There are a few biblical references that can be intended as Yahweh being a metal worker, or at the very least using metallurgical, that's a tough word to say, references to his power. As men gathered steel, excuse me, silver, bronze, iron, lead, and tin into the midst of the furnace to blow fire on it, to melt it, so I will gather you in my anger and in my fury, and I will leave you there and melt you. Uh, he doesn't sound like a nice guy. Yes, I will gather you and blow on you with the fire of my wrath, and you shall be melted in its midst. As silver is melted in the midst of the furnace, 
so shall you be melted in its midst. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have poured out my furnace on you. Ezekiel chapter 22, verses 20 through 22. There is also this passage, Behold, I have created the blacksmith who blows the coals on the fire, who brings forth an instrument for his work, and I have created the spoiler to destroy. Isaiah chapter 54, verse 16. Personally, I do not see the link between the biblical passages leading one to believe that Yahweh was indeed the god of metallurgy, just somebody who liked to kill people. When I read these passages, what I see is a metaphor. Not, hey, God here, I smell copper when I'm not creating the heavens and the earth or causing endless wars. The only reason why I even bring this up is because some scholars have theorized that Yahweh was the god of metallurgy before becoming the supreme deity. With that, now that we have traced the historical desert god of Canaan roots of Yahweh, or quite possibly even being a storm god as he appeared as a cloud and pillar of fire in Exodus or in the book of Job, he speaks to Job from out of a storm. Let's discover how he became the supreme God of the Israelites and in turn the one true God of the Abrahamic religions. After the exodus from Egypt, the Israelites began to develop their civilization in Canaan. This is where they wanted to distance themselves from others in the region and elevate the desert god Yahweh to the supreme deity or El. It was during this time of King David and then his son Solomon that the worship became more formalized. However, after the death of Solomon in 931 BCE, the nation split in two. To the south you had Judah with its capital city of Jerusalem and to the north you had the kingdom of Israel. The two different kingdoms occasionally fought each other, but it wasn't until 722 BCE that the Assyrians destroyed Israel and left Judah intact because Judah bribed the invaders to leave them alone. This did not last long, only about a hundred years, because the Babylonians invaded and destroyed the Assyrian Empire in 612 BCE, claiming the entire region of Canaan. Following the first incursion in 589 BCE, the Babylonians invaded Judah and sacked Jerusalem, destroying the Temple of Solomon. After this, the Babylonians exiled the Jewish people to Babylon. It was during this time that the majority of the books that we know in the modern-day Bible were written. Following this time in exile, which is known as the Second Temple Period, 515 BCE to 70 CE, Judaism was revised, and the Torah was cantonized, making the god Yahweh the supreme god for all time and all three Abrahamic religions. This was an extremely tough video, trying to sum up the origins of Yahweh from desert god to creators, creator of the heavens and earth in only a few passages was no small feat. There is so much more to the story that I could not tell here, this is not because I am trying to hide anything about his origins, but just trying to give an overview. With that, I am not questioning anyone's belief in Yahweh as God Almighty. No, I am simply giving a brief history of his epic story, so that way you're better informed. Okay, I don't think I screwed up too many words in that reading. Like I always say, reading aloud, non-stop, no jump cuts, unedited. It's brutal. So if you like what I'm doing, please like and subscribe. If you really want to help support me, you can check out my books at Amazon or at Barnes & Noble. But until next time, I'll see you again. Love you. Bye.